Welcome to the Exam Room Live, brought to you by the Physicians Committee. Hi, I am the weight loss champion, Chuck Carroll, and this is the healthiest half hour anywhere online today. Appreciate you joining us right here on Facebook and on YouTube. Coming up, Dr. Jim Loomis from the documentary The Game Changers and the medical director from the Barnard Medical Center. He is here. You just saw him for a split second. He is there. He is. That's my guy right there. He is going to be spending the next half hour answering your questions. So what we need you to do is load up that doctor's mailbag. If there's anything on your mind that you would like to ask Dr. Loomis, go ahead and post that in the chat box or the comment section. You can also tweet it to us using that hashtag exam room live. So many good questions already coming in today. People wondering about the best plant-based sources for calcium. We also have other people wondering, can you get enough vitamin D and vitamin B12 from fortified plant milks alone, or do you need to find other sources of that? We're going to talk about alleviating arthritis pain with plant-based diets, and somebody is also asking about foods and eczema. So a lot to get into. Let's not waste any time. Dr. Loomis, you ready to jump right in, my friend? Always, Chuck. Let's Always. do it. The man is always prepared. He is like a Boy Scout. The first question comes to us from Wholesome Milk. Wholesome Milk, uh, Wholesome Vegan, I should say, not Wholesome Milk, misspoke. Wholesome Vegan wants to know, will I get enough vitamin D, vitamin B12, and calcium from so fortified soy milk? Well, so um, first of all, let's talk about how much calcium and vitamin D and vitamin B12 you actually need. Um, so for a... Um, um, Premenopausal woman and a man, um, we're talking maybe a thousand milligrams a day, somewhere in that range. Uh, Postmenopausal women need about 1,200 milligrams a day. Uh, pregnant women need a little bit more as well, 1,200 milligrams a day of calcium. Um, vitamin D, um, the I usually recommend my patients take in, you know, two between you know, around 500 uh, micrograms a day. That's a fairly high dose, but. We remember we only absorb a very small percent, probably about 10% of the dietary vitamin D that we ingest actually gets absorbed in, into our system. Um, and and um, is, that's B12. And so vitamin D, uh, you know, vitamin D is not really a vitamin. It's more like a, it's more like a hormone and it's made in our skin uh, in response to the sun. And we need vitamin D for bone health because the vitamin D helps us absorb that calcium uh, from our diet. Um, now we live far enough north in the DC area, especially in the winter time. Even if you're out in the sun, um, uh, you may not be able to convert enough vitamin D. Um, and even nowadays, when we go out in the sun, we typically cover up and put on sunscreen, which blocks the effect of the sunlight, which we need to to, to convert the vitamin D. So for my patients, I usually recommend you know one to two thousand IU a day, um, somewhere in that range, especially in the winter time. So. Can you get that from from soy milk? Well, I mean, the you you there is some of the vitamin, some of the soy milk is fortified with with D. Typically, it's around 100, one to two hundred IU, from what I can tell. Um, I'm not sure about the B12, but you can kind of do the math. You know, how much do you need to drink to get to that 500? Um, kind of the same thing with the calcium. Now, the, the one caveat around using milk, uh, plant-based milks as your major source of calcium, for example, the best sources of calcium are actually green leafy vegetables, right? So, so in fact, for example, collard greens, a cup of collard greens has almost 300 milligrams of calcium, which is a ton of calcium. Turnip greens, you know, 250, beet greens, you know, almost, you know, 100, 165, mustard greens, 165, bok choy, 150, Swiss chard, 100. So when we, when we consume these green leafy vegetables as our primary source of calcium, what else are we getting that we're not getting in the plant-based milks? 
Well, it's fiber, it's potassium to help lower your blood pressure. So it's really the whole symphony of nutrients that occur in these whole food plant-based sources of, 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 of these micronutrients like calcium. So preferably using whole food plant-based sources of calcium as opposed to soy milk or plant-based milks in general, um, um, is probably a better strategy. And again, there's nothing wrong with using, with drinking soy, soy milk and, 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 but you just kind of have to do the math and see much. You can get too much calcium. Um, you probably don't want to get over about 2,500 milligrams of calcium a day. There's, it can increase your risk for kidney stones and, and things like that. Uh, by the way, tofu is another excellent source of calcium. Um, uh, four ounces of tofu actually has about 700 and almost 800 milligrams of calcium. And the reason is, um, the, the way tofu is made, to, tofu, you take soy milk and you curdle it and, and then you scrape the curds off the top and you press it into a block and that's tofu. And in fact, it, sometimes you'll go to a Chinese restaurant, you'll see bean curd on the menu. That, that's actually tofu. And, and the reason that um, tofu has so much calcium is the curdling agent um, is historically gypsum, which I think is uh, calcium uh, silicate. Uh, I believe that's correct, but but some of that calcium actually elemental calcium actually stays in the tofu, and so that that's why that's such an excellent source of 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 um, calcium. So if you're interested, there's a website I refer a lot of patients to called the World's Healthiest Food that um, has a great. And if you just Google World's Healthiest Food, you know uh, calcium. Now it's not it's not a plant based website, but what's interesting is whether it be calcium, potassium, magnesium, you know you name it. Um, you, what you'll see is the best sources of all of those micronutrients are, are, um, are in fact plant-based. And in fact, cow's milk and cheese on this, on the list of, of high calcium foods is like number 15 or 20, um, 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 way below tofu, collard greens, spinach, um, mustard greens, beet greens, bok choy, et cetera. All right. Well, let's stick on that calcium front. Take a question from Allison. She wants to do a head-to-head -head comparison here. She's asking, is mineral water as good of a calcium source as greens when comparing milligram for milligram? Well, so it, it depends. Um, some mil mineral waters um, do have a fair amount of calcium, um, two or 300 milligrams um, uh, per, per, per um, um, uh, I, I think it's per liter actually. So again, it's kind of the same thing. There's nothing wrong with using a mineral water as, as a source of calcium. But once again, as I pointed out with the soy milk, um, you know, what you're missing when you're using mineral water for calcium is all the other good stuff that comes from plants, the fiber and all the other phytonutrients. So, you know, as part of the strategy to ensure you're getting plenty of calcium, there's certainly nothing wrong with using mineral water. Um, but again, I think a better strategy because of all the wonderful nutrients that come with uh, these whole food plant-based sources, um, a much better strategy to um, 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 try to get your, your um, calcium from whole foods. All right, let's uh, switch gears here. You know, it's a dry, dry air season, lots of dry skin to go with that. Peter here is asking a question along those lines, is asking, is a plant-based diet good for eczema and are there any specific foods that can help when flare-ups occur? Yeah, so um, that's a great question. Um, you know, eczema is also called ato atopic dermatitis. We oftentimes will see it in people who have a history of allergy or asthma. It, it's not an autoimmune disease per se, like more like psoriasis, uh, but, but many people will, will show improvement in their eczema uh, when they go move toward a whole food plant-based diet um, and, and particularly getting rid of dairy. That, that's, I used to have eczema and allergies and, and, and asthma and, and all that went away when I transitioned to a whole food plant-based diet. Um, so it's really about trying to make your diet as anti-inflammatory as possible. And there's kind of two ways you can do that. So one is really limiting, especially if you're on a vegan diet, really limiting the edible oils. Um, edible oils are very high in omega-6 fatty acids. Omega-6s create compounds, prostaglandins and leukotrienes that are inflammatory. The omega-3 fatty acids are anti-inflammatory. Sometimes I will add a little um, algae-based omega-3 supplement to, to kind of jump up some of that an the, the anti-inflammatory uh, compounds in the body. Um, and then, and then the other way to mitigate 
um, inflammation in our bodies is getting plenty of antioxidants. Um, we, we, we burn oxygen and that creates what are called oxygen free radicals. That's called another name for that is, is oxidative stress. Oxidative stress in small doses is good. Oxidative stress in large doses is bad. It can damage our cell walls and cause inflammation and such. The only place we can get extra antioxidant capacity is, is through plants and, and literally eating the rainbow is, is the best way to go. All right. Next question is one on arthritis comes to us from Rochio wants to know I've uh, writes, I've been eating healthier, but my bones still hurt, especially my knees. What about nightshades? What can you tell us there, Dr. Loomis? Well, so some people, they're, they're, some people are concerned that, that nightshade vegetables, and those are like potatoes and tomatoes and things like that, eggplant, may um, uh, create inflammation in the body. There, I don't know of any sound evidence to suggest that, that nightshade vegetables, there's a direct link between you know, joint pain and, and nightshades. Um, so the, again, the, the way to, when we, so first of all, if you're having continued pain, you need to, you, you know, I would suggest you follow up with your, your doctor and be sure there's nothing else going on that you don't have an, any, another form of an, an arthritis, like rheumatoid arthritis or something, a more serious type. Um, again, as far as controlling inflammation in general, we, we kind of just talked about that. And that's really about maximizing the amount of antioxidants, minimizing the amount of omega-6s in the diet, in a plant-based diet, primarily comes from, from edible oils um, and, and, and saturated fats and things like that. And, and, you know, a good example would be things like the Impossible Burger, just being careful with foods like that because, because they do have a lot of, uh, a fair amount of fat, saturated fat, which can be inflammatory um, in pill form. Um, I, I, when I, I trained for and completed an Ironman last summer to celebrate my 60th birthday, unsuccessfully tried to kill myself. Um, but um, um, I used a combination, a turmeric, ginger, black pepper supplement. Um, the, the black pepper is in there because it increases the absorption of curcumin, which is the, the anti-inflammatory part of the, of the turmeric. Um, I, I thought it I had actually had a, a, a my injury. I tripped and fell and banged my knee and had some bleeding in the bursa sac. And I, I thought I was done for. And literally within a, a few days of, of aggressive use of ice and turmeric, I was back on my feet running again. And um, so that's something else I might suggest. There, there are some actually controlled studies comparing um, um, non steroidal anti-inflammatories like Motrin and Aleve and Advil with um, turmeric and, and, and turmeric favorably compares without the side effects that potentially come from, um, from the, um, uh, anti-inflammatory medications. All right. Next question comes to us from Laura. This one uh, wants to know, do triglyceride numbers matter if your cholesterol is dropping while eating a plant-based diet? Yeah, that's a great question. So, um, tr so triglycerides are, are, we measure as part of the lipid panel. And triglycerides are actually how fat is is transported around in in our bloodstream, um, and so it's it's kind of the mechanism when we consume fat in our diet, um, it's absorbed th through our intestines um, as what are called chylomicrons, and then they're, they're just kind of stuck on a lipoprotein molecule called VLDL, and and then they're transported out to the fat cells to be stored for future use. Um, very high triglyceride levels. I mean, I'm talking about extraordinarily high triglyceride levels, you know, 500, 800, 1,000, which I see sometimes. Normal is less than 150, by the way. Um, have been associated with things like pancreatitis. Um, there is an association kind of independent of cholesterol between high triglyceride levels and, and heart disease, although that, that association is not nearly as robust as that of LDL or bad cholesterol. Um, there's also an association between persistently high triglyceride levels and particularly uh, in a combination of other findings like low HDL or low good cholesterol, high blood pressure, borderline blood sugar, you know, increased waist circumference in, in a man above 40 inches and women above 35 inches. That, that's a condition we call metabolic syndrome. And that, that is a sign of insulin resistance, which is a risk factor for developing diabetes and, and, um, and heart disease increases your risk down the road. Um, 
Now, what causes high triglycerides? So, so and the reason that is, by the way, the, the triglyceride, when, when our triglyceride levels get really high, it kind of overwhelms the body's system to, 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 to move the triglyceride out into the fat cells. So it kind of like a snow globe, it kind of precipitates out into the muscle and liver cells. And it's that fat in the muscle and liver cells, which actually cause the insulin resistance, which is the precursor to type two diabetes, et cetera. Um, so what causes high triglycerides? Um, alcohol can raise your triglyceride level. And then the overconsumption of, of processed foods in general, edible oils, um, processed grains, processed sugars, um, um, such as that. So, you know, it's normal for your triglyceride level to go up after you eat. So, so when you get your blood work done, you want to be sure you're fasting to, if you're worried about the triglyceride level, because that is something that will rise naturally. Uh, because when we eat food, our, you know, we absorb that fat, our triglyceride levels go up and that's normal. Um, so, you know, depending on the level, it, it's, it's, you know, if it's, if it's 175, I'm not terribly concerned about that typically, although it does, that is a kind of a signal that you need to maybe tighten up your diet a little bit. High fiber diets, for example, a high fiber, low fat diet is the, is the optimum diet, which is inherently what you see in a whole food plant-based diet because that fiber will actually absorb some of that fat. So it's not absorbed into the body. All right. If you have a question for Dr. Loomis, go ahead and put that in the chat box or the comments. You can also tweet that to us using that hashtag exam room live at PCRM and at Chuck Carroll WLC is where you want to go ahead and send that. Also want to say a quick hello to the vegan dragon who's watching us over in the UK. Hello. Thanks for checking in. And Jacqueline who's tuned in today from Pennsylvania, uh, Philadelphia. So thank you guys both very much for checking in today. Dr. Loomis, coming back to you. This is the next question. It comes to us from from uh, who's the, Elaine? Elaine wants to know what can a vegan do about GERD. So um, GERD is a, is is um, is a uh, stands for uh, gastroesophageal reflux disease. So normally we have a uh, so our esophagus is the swallowing tube, and, and just below the diaphragm or the breathing muscle, it uh, it meets the stomach. And um, normally there's a ring of muscle uh, right at that junction called the lower esophageal sphincter. And it keeps food from, from refluxing back up into the esophagus, which can cause symptoms like heartburn and, and things like that. Um, so the, probably the most important thing that people can do is avoid eating within three hours of going to bed. Um, because if you think about it, when we eat, that stimulates stomach acid because stomach acid, we need the stomach acid to help us start to pre-digest our food. And you can imagine when you lay down, that's just a gravity thing, right? It's much harder for when you're sitting up, it's much harder for acid and such to go back up than when you're laying down because it, you know, it's a flat tube. Um, so that's probably the most important thing. There are other uh, specific foods which um, can sometimes contribute. So foods that are really acidy, um, things like, uh, you know, alcohol, um, sometimes foods that are really spicy um, can be a problem. Uh, wearing tight clothes um, can be a problem. Um, using, uh, uh, being overweight can, can increase your risk for, for GERD. Now, there are some people that have, despite all that, still have reflux. And, and again, in that situation, you wouldn't want to follow up with your, um, uh, with your primary care doctor or gastroenterologist because sometimes, um, that opening um, where the esophagus passes through is enlarged. And we call that a hiatal hernia. Hiatus is just a Latin word for a kind of opening or door. And, and you get a little bulge of stomach up through that opening and it disrupts that lower esophageal sphincter. Um, um, Dr. Greger on nutritionfacts.org um, has some great videos uh, about, about some other kind of specific things you can do. So if you just go to nutritionfacts.org and search for the, the his uh, uh, lectures, his talks on, um, on GERD, I think you might find those informative as well. All right. Uh, we were talking earlier about omega-3s when you were answering the question about eczema. Silence uh, wants to follow up on that, wants to know, can I get omega-3s by sprouting chia and flax seeds? Yes, uh, you, you can. Um, and, and so it, it's kind of unclear. There hasn't been a lot of research um, about about where sprouting increases the amount of omega three, but it, but it may actually um, there it it may also actually increase the the uh, the, the concentration of some other beneficial um, um, uh, micronutrients. So sprouting is great, although you don't necessarily need to sprout to get 
the health benefits of the chia and flaxseed. Um, you know, if you look at the, the best sources of omega-3, uh, um, flaxseed is, is probably the, the, the highest source. Um, there's about 6,400 um, milligrams of, of omega-3 in, in a serving. Uh, hemp seed, chia seed, close behind, walnuts, a little bit less. Interestingly enough, there's even um, there's even um, omega-3s in Brussels sprouts, believe it or not. Um, and when you cook Brussels sprouts, it the, the amount of omega-3s actually triples. So, you know, and so again, I, I think using these various foods and, 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 and you know, I, what I typically do, if I, if I make a recovery shake after a long run or a long bike ride, I throw some chia seed in it. I'll throw some flax seed in my oatmeal in the morning or, you know, walnuts on my, on my oatmeal or in a salad. Uh, I'll, I'll put hemp seed on a salad. Um, so I, I, I kind of use a combination of all of these things um, to, um, um, to um, um, make sure I'm getting enough omega-3s. Again, very important because of the anti-inflammatory uh, uh, component of that. All right. We have a lot of people today asking about iron. Seems to be a hot topic. Uh, some people are wondering, well, my iron levels are still low, even though I'm eating what I think are high iron containing uh, fruits or vegetables, I should say. And I'm eating that with some vitamin C to help with absorption, but the levels are still low. So what is some advice that you have to help raise those iron levels? Well, you know, so, so, so there's two issues with iron deficiency. One is treating it, right? We need iron to make, to make red blood cells. And when our iron levels drop low, we become anemic. And when we're anemic, if the anemic, if we, we, you know, our blood cells carry oxygen. And when we're very anemic, that can create some serious health issues because we can't get enough oxygen to our heart and to our brain. And we're tired all the time and we get out of breath and we go up the stairs and such as that. So treating iron deficiency is very important. Um, and, um, you know, ensuring you get a, a, an adequate amount of iron. Now, depending on how low the iron is, um, you know, sometimes people do need a little kind of boost and might, you know, might need to take an iron supplement, but you should probably talk to your primary care doctor or your provider about that. The, the bigger concern is why are you iron deficient, right? It, it's, it, it's pretty unusual to become iron deficient, um, even on a plant-based diet, unless you've got some form of ongoing blood loss. Um, in premenopausal women, obviously, with their monthly period, you, there's kind of an obligate blood loss. So it's not that uncommon to see iron deficiency in, in, a, in a younger woman. Um, over the age of 40, though, and in men in particular, the risk of iron deficiency from, um, uh, from some kind of slow GI blood loss starts to go up. And so certainly, um, um, you know, I'd be a little bit concerned that 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 the reason you're not responding is you, there's some kind of ongoing blood loss, which is kind of outpacing. You're losing more blood than you're making, and and certainly that would be need to be something that would be evaluated. There are a few people that don't absorb iron very well. Um, you know, people with like celiac disease, or if you've had bariatric surgery and things like that. Sometimes in severe cases, we actually have to give iron infusions. But again, th th now we're moving more toward those are really medical conditions that you need to discuss with your primary care doctor. Yeah, I'll tell you, you know, uh, you're talking about internal bleeding. Uh, I actually, I wound up in the hospital uh, because I had an ulcer and my iron levels plummeted. So did my hemoglobin. That's really what landed me in there. I had no idea that my iron was so low until they took the numbers. Um, but then, you know, get the ulcer treated and you're good to go again. Right. Exactly right. Uh, we have a question from the team at 1217. Don't know who's on that team, but they're asking the question. Do you have any advice for IBS for food sensitivities and allergies? Yeah, so IBS stands for irritable bowel syndrome. And we don't really know what causes it. Irritable bowel syndrome is kind of a diagnosis of exclusion, right? You, you make sure there's nothing else going. You don't have Crohn's disease or you don't have, you know, uh, ulcerative colitis. And, and it, you know, the symptoms can be similar. And then what's left over? It, we call IBS. So I, IBS um, can cause a lot of different kinds of symptoms. Some people get constipated. Some people get diarrhea. Usually it's alternating the two, you know, gassy, bloating. I, I think there's increasing evidence that IBS is really not a GI issue per se it, it, or, or a food issue per se. It's a gut microbiome problem, frankly. Um, because when we 
when we, you know, if we could design an environment in the modern world to destroy the human gut microbiome, we've done it, right? Um, babies are born with a sterile gut and they have a, a vaginal delivery um, and that's your first dose of bacteria. Then you breastfeed um, from your mother and then we get uh, bacteria for the mother's skin. And then the rest of our lives, we got our food out of the dirt. We played in the dirt. We drank water that had bacteria. So we're constantly replenishing, you know, making this healthy, healthy gut microbiome. Fast forward to the modern world, you know, we C-section babies. We don't breastfeed anymore. We, we, we put so much junk on our food, pesticides and herbicides. We have to scrub the dirt off to make it edible. We, we polluted the water. So we have to chlorinate it to kill the bacteria. We start passing out antibiotics at a young age. Um, so which, which can't tell the difference between good and bad bacteria. So, so we have kind of designed this environment where, where people's gut microbiome get disrupted. And what happens is when, when, when our gut, when we don't have the kind of the right bacteria to digest certain foods, um, legumes or, or um, 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 uh, different kinds of oligosaccharides or sugars, um, those, they actually get fermented in the colon by colonic bacteria. And that's what actually causes the, the symptoms. So, so typically the way I approach uh, irritable bowel syndrome in, um, for people who are struggling with this is, is A, um, you, you really want to focus on eating um, foods that have a lot of prebiotics. Um, and that's particularly soluble fiber. There's a great book uh, by uh, Dr. William B uh, called, the, called Fiber Fueled which would re is really fantastic. I recommend that for every, for most everyone should read it, frankly. Um, so it's really about soluble fiber, refined in beans and lentils, such as that. Um, doing an elimination diet in the short run until you can kind of fix your gut microbiome, which can take anywhere from a few weeks to a few months, depending on how disrupted it is. Um, and, and so there's a concept called a low FODMAP diet and FODMAPs are fermentable, fermentable, that's the F. And then the rest are the kinds of sugars. So oligo, di, mono, saccharides, those are, those are strings of sugar. Um, and you can, you can find, um, uh, there's a couple of great websites. If you just Google vegan uh, FODMAP diet, low FODMAP diets, it'll kind of give you a, a list of foods to kind of think about uh, eliminating. And so what I have patients do is kind of eliminate those foods in the short run. In the meantime, trying to restore their gut microbiome. And, and then after a few months, you can start to kind of reintroduce foods one at a time. So, I, you know, in my opinion, I don't it's, it's rare to have a true food allergy. I think these are food intolerances created by gut by dysbiosis, frankly. Um, the role of probiotics, this comes up. Um, um, not a lot of research on it. The, the research is probably negative, if anything. Um, using fermented foods uh, is important. Uh, I'm talking about, I'm not talking about the, you know, pasteurized pickles you get off the grocery store shelf, you know, the farmer's market or make your own, ferment your own pickles, kimchi, uh, sauerkraut, things like that um, 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 is, is helpful. Um, another place that often gets overlooked as far as the fermental sugars uh, is, um, or sugar alcohol. So being very careful with things like xylitol, mannitol, sorbitol, you'll often find those as artificial sweeteners in, in breath mints and gums. Um, I've had a lot of patients who we couldn't really figure out why they weren't getting better. And it turns out, you know, they're using breath mints all day and it's, they're, they're not tolerating the sorbitol or the xylitol that's in the, those, those are fermentable alcohol sugars. So, um, and obviously, you know, if you haven't, if your symptoms persist, seeking medical care and maybe seeing a gastroenterologist just to be sure this, this is inf to just confirm the diagnosis and be sure you're not missing anything more serious. All right. Uh, let's see if we can knock out a couple more of these questions really quickly here. And uh, as we're in the home stretch, by the way, Dr. Bolsowitz, uh, the author of Fiber, oh, yes. he, he will be here. I know that's a, that's a tough name, uh, but Dr. Bolsowitz will be here on the show next Wednesday. So if you oh, haven't great. already liked us on Facebook or subscribe to this channel on YouTube, go ahead and do that right now. You'll get an alert whenever we go live, including next Wednesday's show with Dr. B. A uh, quick question here, Dr. Loomis from Beth Ann. She says, I just had my B. 12 level checked, but what is considered a good level? I got the results, but no feedback. So um, the, the, the normal range of B12 is, is, is quite uh, broad and um, uh, depending on the lab. In general though, so in general, um, we like to see levels between about 
250, 300, depending on the lab, and up to around 1,000, 1,100, something like that. Now, the blood test for B12 is, is – is if your blood if your if your B12 comes back 500 600 800 900 you're fine right now there are some people that have B12 levels on the low end of normal say 300 or or 325 or something like that which are officially in the normal range but maybe having some symptoms of B12 deficiency and then so we need B12 let me just back up for a minute so B12 is important for several aspects of our health um, Probably most importantly, it's important for our nervous system to function healthily. Uh, healthfully. Um, so chronically low B12 can lead to memory loss, depression, uh, numbness and tingling in your feet and hands, what's called a peripheral neuropathy. We also need B12 to make blood cells. And we, and we, when we don't get enough, it can lead to a condition. Um, it can lead to an anemia. People who, um, there's an autoimmune disease called pernicious anemia where we can't actually absorb, we, we, we can't make the acid we need to absorb the B12. And, and so that's, uh, that causes uh, anemia. Um, so there are some people that'll come in and, and, and you can kind of tell if you're like, for example, on the blood work, your red blood cells might be larger than normal, which can be a sign of, of, of B12 deficiency. So in, the, in those situations, either there's a couple of choices. One is to bump up the B12 dose to a little bit higher or, but there are some other blood tests called methylmalonic acid and homocysteine, which um, are much more sensitive to, for detecting both B12 and folic acid deficiency. I don't order those very often, but there are times when people have these kind of borderline low B12 levels. Now, the thing is, if, if they're on the low end of normal, what, what, even if your homocysteine and B12 indicate B12 deficiency, what are you going to do? We're going to go up on the dose, right? So typically, as I mentioned earlier, we need about 500 micrograms a day. Um, some people who we need stomach acid to, to absorb the B12. Some people who take chronic acid suppressing medicine, like the little purple pill, uh, like Prilosec or Nexium or Prevacid to help to treat GERD. We use that sometimes. Um, sometimes if you're on that for a long period of time, you, you can't absorb enough of the B12, even in food. Uh, to, and, and so you have to go up on the dose a little bit. But again, it, it, that's a situation where you probably need to to, to speak with your primary care doctor if you're if you can't maintain a normal B12 level. Now um, you can't take too much B12. Um, you know I oftentimes will see people with B12 levels you know 12, 1300. There's not a lot of evidence around adverse effects of that. There there is an association between high B12 levels and, and acne. Interestingly enough, there was a recent study that showed that people that had B12, high B12 levels had a higher mortality rate. They died soon, but these were people who weren't taking supplements. So for whatever, something about their metabolism, which was have, causing them to overproduce B12, you know, was, was, is probably the issue. Um, you know, when I see those levels, I used to, that, that's almost always people over supplementing. I don't think I've ever seen anyone with a high level who's taken 500 micrograms a day. These are people taking, you know, 1,000, 2,000, 1,500 micrograms a day. So if you limit your B12, if you, you know, if, if you're in that kind of 2,500 to 3,500 micrograms a week, you should be good with B12. Yeah, I'm going to isolate that clip. I'm going to play it back for my wife. She's got these sublingual B12 supplements and they taste like cherry and she loves them. Like she looks <laughs> forward to that every single day. It's like candy to her. But I'm going to be like, wait a minute, honey. Wait a minute. Watch this. Uh, we got time for one more question and we made it a full half hour without addressing this. And I'm shocked. I am shocked, Dr. Loomis, that we have not yet spoken about protein. So this question comes to us from Byron. He says, I find it very hard to get enough protein in a day. Should I be drinking protein powder drinks? Well, so first of all, yeah, I think the big question is, is how much protein do you need? Right? So I, you know, there's a lot of misconceptions about, about how much protein we actually need. Um, and and so for someone who kind of leads a normal level of activity, you need about 0 0.8 grams per kilogram. Um, if you're an endurance athlete, maybe 1.2 to 1.5. If you're a strength training athlete, maybe up to two grams per kilogram. So that's about a gram a pound, something like that, uh, roughly. We also, most people way overestimate or underestimate how much protein they're actually getting, right? If you're eating a well-balanced whole food plant-based diet and you're getting enough calories, it is almost impossible 
to A, be protein deficient, or B, be um, uh, in, deficient in any individual amino acid. Uh, proteins are made up of strings of amino acid. We consume that protein, we break it down in our gut, we absorb the individual amino acids and they're kind of reassembled into the proteins that we need. Um, so there are health consequences of over-consuming um, uh, uh, protein. Um, there's an increased risk for kidney disease, uh, uh, certain cancers, um, the list goes on. So you certainly don't want to get too much protein. Um, I might suggest that, that uh, oftentimes when patients are concerned if they're getting enough protein is I'll have them use an app like Chronometer or MyFitnessPal, keep an honest food diary for a day or two that so you can average it out and, and see how much protein you're getting. Um, in general, a whole food plant-based diet offers about 15% of your total calories as protein, which is enough. It's plenty, right? Really. And, and again, if you're training for an Ironman, you're not eating 1800 calories a day. You know, you're eating 2000 calories a day. I mean, 4,000 calories a day. You know, if you're, if you're a competitive bodybuilder, you're not eating 2000 calories, you're eating 4,000 calories a day. What happens to your protein intake? Well, it's doubled, right? So it's not pro typically it's not protein people need to worry about it's calories. So again, can you use protein powders? Yes, it's okay. But again, back to the whole discussion we had earlier about calcium. Um, when we eat, when we use whole foods like beans and lentils for our primary protein source or broccoli, you know, broccoli has protein. Um, we're also getting all the other phytonutrients, antioxidants, anti-inflammatory compounds, as opposed to when we isolate the protein from the food itself and put it into a powder and put it into a shake. We lose that symphony of nutrients that I talked about earlier. I think, you know, so often we isolate these particular nutrients, but I think that if we focused our attention on just educating the general public about what a whole food actually is, I think it's, that that would go a very long way to helping uh, cure a lot of what ails us in the health department. I, I agree. I mean, we, we do practice health reductionism. We, we have stopped talking about food, right? We talk about what food's made out of. We talk about carbs. We talk about protein. We talk about, we talk about fiber. We talk about omega-3s. We talk about calcium. And that leads to some crazy ideas, Chuck. I mean, think about it. 30 years ago, you know, we were worshiping carbs and, and demonizing fat, right? The era of Snackwell's cookies. And everyone got obese because they're, you know, they think, well, there's no fat. It's free food, right? You know, now we're worshiping protein and we're demonizing carbs. It's not the carbs. It's not the protein. And it's not the fat. It's the package those foods come in, right? Yep. And when we eat a package of food that that not only takes care of our macronutrient needs, you know, the fat, the protein and the calories, but also all that other good stuff, the fiber and all that, you don't really need to worry about it anymore. And I, I think you're exactly right. I think shifting the dialogue from what food's made out of to food and understanding what food is and developing literacy around that, it, it, it could, would go a long way. I mean, you know, I, I like to use the analogy you know, you don't put diesel gas in your car in moderation, right? And expect it to run right. We're going to spend three and a half trillion dollars on healthcare this year. And the CDC estimates 70 to 80 percent of that is spent on preventable diseases, primarily to compete complete because we repetitively have to fix people's cars because they keep putting the wrong kind of gas in it. Right. Yep. And, and again, it's because we don't really understand that that uh, that food is the kind of gas we're designed to run on. It's not protein and it's not fat and it's not you know, it's food, right? Yep. So. Yep. You know, a few years ago, I got the opportunity. Whole Foods flew me down to Texas. They had a, a big meeting and they were looking for feedback. And one of the ideas I was kicking around to John Mackey and the other executives in the room at that point was, well, why not in your produce section, especially, you know, educate consumers as they shop, tell them about the importance of these nutrients, what's contained in the papaya, what's contained in this honey crisp apple or pineapple or carrots or whatever the case may be. So you educate as well as shop. And I thought that that was a pretty novel idea for really improving the health of shoppers. And, and, and we tend to, as Americans to shop in the middle of the store and not <laughs> along the perimeter where the fresh food is. But I think that if you had this, this library to go with all of these healthy foods, I think people would be so much more inclined to buy them because as that saying goes, knowledge is power. Yeah, it's interesting. So Michael Pollan, the food writer, is in his book In Defense of Food, had these kind of uh, read these kind of rules for healthy eating. And his the primary, the main one is you know eat less, mostly plants, which is pretty straightforward. But he has one called the Silence of the Yams, right? <laughs> and 
And, and it's this idea that just because a yam doesn't have a sticker on it that says high, you know, high fiber, low fat, you know, high in beta carotene, whatever, doesn't mean it's not one of the healthiest foods in the store. And then when we see foods with these nutritional claims, that usually means it's been highly processed and had the good, some of the bad stuff taken out and more of the good stuff put in. But it becomes a, he calls them edible food-like substances, right? Which is, I think, you know, it's great. So anyway. So appropriate. All right, Dr. Loomis, we've taken up enough of your time. We started with calcium and, and went everywhere else and in between. So thank you very much, my friend. Have a phenomenal weekend. Always a pleasure. All right. If you want to schedule an appointment to meet with Dr. Loomis, you can do that over at the Barnard Medical Center. He is ready to visit with you. Uh, I don't want to say telepathically, but certainly via telemedicine. You can do that. All you need to do to schedule your appointment is head over to, you see that on the screen right there, barnardmedical.org or call 202-527-7500 for a full list of states where services are available. You can talk to them about insurance and the whole kit and caboodle. So schedule your appointment today with Dr. Loomis or any one of the wonderful plant-based doctors and dietitians now available, I think, in more than a quarter of the entire country. So barnardmedical.org, 202-527-7500. Let's end today with uh, a trip to the exam room news desk. Uh, it's a feel-good Friday. So your one and only health headline is down in Texas, okay? I want to tell you about a cattle rancher in Texas who was breaking from a 100-year family tradition and saying, no longer will I be raising cows for slaughter. And instead, what we're going to do, we are going to shift over to a plant-based farm. We are going to grow broccoli. We're going to grow radishes. We're going to grow hemp. We're going to grow bamboo. And why are we doing this? Because Richard Trailer tells Veg News that back in 2018, one of the cows at his ranch, a cow by the name of Honey, got sick, got injured. And the only people who would help that cow down there was an animal sanctuary. And that opened their eyes to it. So here we are two years later. They are going all in, getting away from that 100 year, that century old family model of raising cattle for slaughter. And instead, we'll be growing nutritious food for everyone. How cool is that? So to the trailers, congratulations. And thank you very much. That is all the time that we have for the show today. Oh, by the way, oh my gosh, I can't believe we didn't talk about this. It's National Cookie Day, everybody. It is National Cookie Day, and you can have healthy plant-based cookies. It is, in fact, possible. And as a matter of fact, on yesterday's Exam Room podcast, I sat down with uh, Audrey Dunham. Talk to her over the phone for a good long while. She has a new vegan cookbook out just filled with nothing but vegan Christmas cookie recipes and other holiday treats, even homemade marshmallows, for goodness sakes. So we run through all of that, plus the balance between indulgence and healthy dieting. So she's a former fitness competitor, and she kind of walks us through how she still indulges from time to time in her diet, but still keeps it relatively healthy, plus all of those phenomenal recipes. So if you want to get in on that conversation, celebrate National Cookie Day, and get some ideas on what it is that you want to cook up from her new vegan Christmas cookbook, go ahead and head over to Apple Podcast or Spotify or Stitcher. Just look for the Exam Room Podcast by the Physicians Committee. Hit that subscribe button and leave a five-star rating. All right. Now that is all the time that we have for today and this week. I want to say thank you once again to Dr. Jim Loomis for all of his time and education today. Appreciate him helping us raise our nutrition IQs and to the crew behind the scenes that always makes the magic happen so beautifully. Thank you all very much. And to you, my exam roomies, thank you for learning alongside of us and helping to make the world a healthier place. For everyone here at the Physicians Committee, I am the weight loss champion, Chuck Carroll. We'll talk to you again on Monday. Dr. Neil Barnard is going to be here talking about eating for your blood type. Is there something to that or is that a myth? He's got a new paper out and we're going to be talking all about that. So set your appointment for noon Eastern, 9 a.m. Pacific. But until then, stay safe, take a stand, and keep it plant-based.